I'm Rachel Deer from DKB Med, filling in for our host, Faith Rogers. Thank you for joining us. This is our second installment of our new coronavirus educational activities as part of DKB Med's radio hour. Our plan is to provide twice weekly 15 minute webcasts and podcast updates featuring the latest news and answering your questions about COVID-19. Please know that just as knowledge of COVID-19 is evolving, this program will evolve over time as new information warrants. We welcome your suggestions to make this as beneficial as possible. Today's program is accredited for ANCC and AMA PRA Category 1 credits. Please visit our website at covid19.dkbmed.com for complete CE information. This program is independently funded by DKB Med. To access other free CE programs, please visit us at dkbmed.com. For more information on COVID-19 and to view last week's webcast with Dr. Atwater, please visit covid19.dkbmed.com. Here are our overall learning objectives for the program. And with us today, we have Dr. Atwater, Clinical Director of the Division of Infectious Disease at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Dr. Atwater, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Rachel, and I want to thank DKB, uh, the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, and also the Institute for Johns Hopkins Nursing for generous support. Uh, I'll also mention that earlier programs are uh, archived on the website that Rachel mentioned. <clears throat> so the goal today is to really is um, a very uh, small uh, amount of information that is growing um, and uh, the pandemic is as well, but hopefully this can help inform some of your clinical knowledge and perhaps practices for your patients. Now, uh, I am highlighting here what are considered active uh, cases that are on our Johns Hopkins map. Uh, and of course, New York City has been at the forefront as a true hotspot, but as you can see, this virus is clearly urban centric. And there's been a lot of debate about why this pandemic has spread so quickly. Uh, I often hear questions that are somewhat anxiety driven about whether this virus is transmitted as an aerosol instead of a droplet, but yet there is no clear indication that it uh, does so in the communities. Although uh, again, there are concerns. Probably more likely is the fact that people do shed the virus for two days before they become ill. And there's a sense uh, that a growing, um, uh, a growing knowledge of people are asymptomatic uh, shedders, meaning uh, they acquire the virus, they have the infection, but they don't get ill. And of course, this would be a way a virus could be highly successful to transmit infections when people do not know they have it. And of course, this is often the way how venereal diseases are spread. Uh, but in this case, this is a respiratory one. And uh, with most people uh, becoming ill, but even if they do, it's mild illness and people can think, oh, is it allergies? Is it just a mild smoker's cough and yet transmit the virus? So I, I think that's why we're seeing such rapid increases now. And, and uh, the United States is at the lead. Uh, in terms of clinical experience, most of it had been informed from China, but this is some early data uh, on critical illness from Washington State. And some of this is not a surprise, older patients with comorbidities. However, this group tended to present only after three and a half days of illness and by day five landed in the intensive care unit. Like many of the ill patients we're seeing even here in Baltimore, they have a low white blood cell count. And at least for this group uh, who were hypoxic, many ended up on mechanical ventilation. Here at Hopkins, we actually don't use BiPAP. We tend to do early intubation in an effort uh, to not only assist the patient before crisis, but also help prevent uh, potentially uh, difficulties with um, <clears throat> exposure to healthcare workers. Um, most people who developed IRDS like changes who required mechanical ventilation. And one of the interesting points is about a third of these patients had cardiac dysfunction. It's not clear if it was the virus or the stress of illness. And uh, this may be a group uh, that perhaps uh, uh, we have to be very careful about using drugs that prolong QT intervals, um, although the uh, uh, 
uh, a cardiology group has come out to say hydroxychloroquine probably in short doses would not cause problems uh, in terms of QT prolongation. Uh, this group did not fare well with nearly a 70% mortality rate at the time of publication last week. Now moving to testing, which unfortunately remains uh, not as widespread or as bountiful as we hope. The CDC revised their testing algorithm a little over a week ago to emphasize hospitalized patients and, and then people who are at high risk with comorbidities or in institutions along with first responders. A third priority would be uh, trying to understand uh, cases in community settings and individuals that are deemed essential. And then non-priority is uh, people that aren't having symptoms uh, were not deemed um, a priority in terms of having testing. Again, still just reflecting uh, the testing issues. Additionally, I'd have to say, besides the limited capacity, I think we have a growing sense that although it's a molecular technology where the nasopharyngeal swabs are inserted into the nasopharynx and and RT-PCR is performed. The sensitivity is probably less than 90% in both hands. This could be because of problems with swab procurement, but may also just reflect uh, how these tests have been, been developed and operate in these conditions. It's um, not clear if positive samples, for example, 10 to 14 days into a patient's course are still infectious because of course we're just detecting RNA. And there's some information that suggests that uh, samples such as a bronco alveolar lavage may yield better samples, but of course this uh, is probably a procedure that uh, shouldn't be done unnecessarily, especially with a highly infectious agent. There has now been a number of more rapid molecular tests. The Gene Expert, which many of you may be familiar with for tuberculosis or C. difficile, they now have a COVID cartridge with results in under 45 minutes, so fairly fast. And Abbott had purchased a layer, which some may have used for influenza, uh, and now has a rapid uh, test as well, uh, with a quick result for positives, a little longer for negatives. Um, so if you have these platforms, this may be an opportunity. Uh, to date, even uh, the RT-PCR from Genmark and others, no one is really releasing their analytical data for clinical validation. So we're not quite sure exactly how sensitive these are, but with increasing prevalence in our communities, I do think we have to step back and wonder if someone has fever, cough, and infiltrates, the likelihood that this is COVID is probably fairly high, even if a molecular test is negative. Now, um, the FDA did allow uh, 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 qualified laboratories to develop their own tests, so-called laboratory-developed tests. So there are now uh, many serology tests that um, are both commercial or homebrew tests at institutions. The FDA has issued warnings because at the moment, even if these have passed analytical standards, we don't really have extensive uh, clinical validation yet, but probably serology uh, is only uh, positive based on some data from China so far by day seven after onset of symptoms, but it should not be relied upon at the moment to either include or exclude infection, and there may be cross-reactivity with some of the normal coronavirus strains that have been circulating for years that cause respiratory illness. Now, as a reminder for therapeutics, uh, a search uh, in PubMed for uh, clinical trials for COVID still yielded nothing. Almost everything we have so far is on uh, preliminary results or series that actually hadn't yet made it and are only in preprint publications or not yet peer reviewed. So this, this remains a fraught area where uh, I think people are trying things that may have some biological plausibility but uh, outside of a randomized clinical trial, we really don't know what's best for our patients. And ethically, an RCT is probably the only way to offer these drugs, but in these desperate times, I think people are looking at a number of modalities. So very quickly, monoclonal antibodies or convalescent sera are under uh, uh, exploration now with trials starting. 
um, and we'll talk more about that uh, briefly, but an effort to bind to the virus before it enters cells. Uh, Camostat is a compound that interrupts binding uh, to the um, receptors, the TMP RSS2. This is a drug uh, that I believe is approved in um, Asia and Japan uh, that has some interest in interrupting binding. Now, chloroquine and, and really hydroxychloroquine in the United States has gotten a lot of press. Uh, the thought is it somehow inhibits acidification within a phagolysosome and therefore uh, viral uh, replication. Uh, there's yet no convincing data, but uh, there are small series suggesting effect. I would just give warning that this drug has failed against influenza Ebola virus uh, in human trials. And um, if this does work uh, in humans, we'll need a large trial to probably show benefit. And, um, uh, and it does have some potential toxicities. The protease inhibitor lopinavir ritonavir um, uh, did not show um, efficacy in a, a randomized trial published in the Engel Journal recently in hospitalized patients that also got a lot of other compounds. Remdesivir, uh, the trial <clears throat> as an antiviral uh, has been completed, is my understanding, in terms of enrollment in the United States, or is very nearly so. Um, this is a drug that probably has the best evidence in preclinical data so we await um, information. Unfortunately, at least at the moment, as of today, the compassionate use of this drug is only for pregnant women and children. Um, so uh, in terms of hydroxychloroquine, uh, there has been one randomized controlled trial published um, as a preprint that did not show any difference in viral carriage, length of stay, or radiographic improvement, as I mentioned. Given this is the only RCT that I'm aware of, um, if it is effective, the uh, likelihood of effects are probably modest. Um, in terms of convalescent plasma, as I mentioned, this, this is an area that really certainly has worked for other pathogens. The FDA has released an emergency investigational drug application that you could apply for. However, they do not supply plasma, so it's up to uh, the individual to try to find uh, convalescent plasma. I've listed here, but won't describe uh, the eligibility criteria for this, which really uh, suggests that they should have severe or immediately life-threatening COVID-19 with some of the criteria outlined here. So uh, I'll continue to try to uh, bring up to date as new information comes to light and uh, hope some of that's useful. I think we unfortunately still don't really know if any drugs are effective, and I understand the uh, the desire to try to help our patients as well. But I think, Rachel, you, we also have some questions. Should I move on to the first one? Sure. Um, before you do that, I'm just going to say, Dr. Atwater, um, so again, thank you for those updates. So to submit questions for future sessions of your own, please send questions to qa at dkbmed.com. That's Q is in question, A is in answer at dkbmed.com. And if we're not able to address your questions in, the, uh, in that session, we'll try to address it in the upcoming session. And yeah, Dr. Water, we've got about four questions. I want to be mindful of your time, but we'd like to uh, at least go over these four. So the first one I'll read. There has been some debate on chest x-rays and chest CTs. I've been reading that ground glass opacities are often seen in COVID-19 patients in earlier stages of the virus. Are you able to provide information on this? Is this factual? Yes, yeah, so there has been published data from China where uh, people had ground glass uh, infiltrates and other uh, changes to the lung. And this was even before uh, apparently uh, they would have a positive nasopharyngeal aspirate. I think uh, this is something that I know some centers in the United States are doing, but it's also logistically challenging to have patients go to scanners. Um, I think as this becomes more and more of a prevalent infection, instead of influenza or community-acquired pneumonia. This is something to consider, uh, and certainly if you do have CT scans and have these kind of characteristics, it should certainly uh, jump to the top of the list. Okay, I care for immunocompromised patients. What kind of immune response has been seen with these patients? Do they mount a fever, et cetera? 
Yeah, so I think we're still uh, coming to some clinical understanding of COVID-19. There are some very interesting aspects. Uh, some studies have suggested that people presenting with GI symptoms might have more severe illness. Um, the prevalence of fever, uh, which initially was said to be 80 to 90% plus range, is probably as low as 43% when patients present to hospital. And although I can't tell you that immunosuppressed patients um, don't mount fever uh, as well or mount more of a fever, um, I do think this is a, a patient category, much like an influenza, that are at risk for more severe illness. Okay, the next question. In a previous webinar, a question was asked regarding when infected persons might be safe to return from social isolation. Now, some data seem to indicate a possible carrier state in some persons. Will antibody testing and or viral or a phalangeal testing be available and needed to avoid releasing such persons back into the vulnerable population? Yeah, so uh, the, these are really uh, important questions. We know from just uh, molecular testing on nasopharyngeal swabs that if the uh, number of cycles needed to find a virus is above uh, the 30s, typically we can't culture virus anymore. So assuming that the swab is done correctly and, and so on and it's later in illness, a negative swab may be reassuring and then uh, if antibody tests are further validated and we know um, that there's neutralizing antibody present, I think this also will help reassure. This is some of the reasons why there's now interval recommendations that in order for someone to feel like they're not um, capable of infecting others, the current recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control are that people should be completely symptom-free of fever or respiratory symptoms without the aid of anything like antipyretics, cough suppressants, and so on for the 72 hours. Um, and that can only be uh, starting from at least seven days after the onset of symptoms, which essentially means 10 days after onset of symptoms would be the earliest that that could happen, assuming you're symptom-free. So for the moment, I think we're still left with clinical criteria just because of um, issues regarding testing ability, and also that we haven't yet fully characterized serological testing. Okay, great. And our last question. There seems to be information suggesting that COVID-19 is transmitted in aerosols and not just droplets. What do you think about that? Do you think lay people wearing masks while out in public may reduce risk of spread of the virus? I think this issue remains one of the hottest topics discussed in many areas, including public health, the lay public, the media, and so on. Part of this was driven by the New England Journal uh, paper a few weeks ago, which was an experimental uh, paper that essentially uh, manufactured aerosols and found um, that, uh, of course, uh, with with an aerosol generator and also a drum, they were able to um, develop this. And this is different than typically droplets. Now, as I mentioned before, there's still, I don't think any convincing evidence that this is spread by droplets, is, I mean, by aerosol. Is it impossible? Uh, is it possible infrequently? It may be, um, but I don't think that's the standard by any route. Uh, and in terms of the mask issue, you know, if you're ill, masks are very helpful, um, so you don't uh, cough and spread uh, droplets more. Uh, we know from influenza masks, surgical masks may slightly reduce risk of uh, acquiring infection. Uh, so this, this is currently a, a source of vigorous debate. I think we're also cognizant of the fact that uh, personal protective equipment is so limited um, but uh, I think this is a debate that uh, is certainly out there, and I think um, uh, we'll see if uh, this changes. Um, I think people feel better if they're wearing masks, um, but there's also downsides. So I think we'll, we'll sort of see how this uh, plays out. I 
somewhat reassured that at least with MERS, uh, uh, that uh, droplet precautions seem to be um, uh, the solution for healthcare workers as long as they followed strict droplet precautions, they stopped getting infected. And, and so that's a bit reassuring to me given the similarities of the virus. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Atwater. You well, advance. thank you. Yep, thank you, Rachel. And um, uh, thanks very much for listening and, and the support from our sponsors. Great. And lastly, to receive credit, if you would like to claim CE credit, please complete the evaluation at covid19.dkbmed.com and select today's activity. Uh, and to all of our listeners, please be on the lookout for our next activity. We'll, we will send out an email when it is available next week. Any questions can be submitted by sending to qa at dkbmed.com. That's Q as in question and A as in answer at dkbmed.com. Thank you again so much, Dr. Alwater, for your time today. Okay. Have a good day, everyone. You too. Thank you. Thank you.